I hope you're well. Um, let me just uh, double check a couple of things before we actually get started here. Um, I was in conversation with somebody this afternoon and I came across this article, which is very, very good news for first time buyers. So that's the whole purpose of this live right here to talk you through uh, the new zero 100 percent deposit for renters, uh, which is actually very, very different to one that I maybe covered 10 months ago. So if you're a first time buyer, you probably want to pay attention to this. I'm just going to go through everything that we know about this new offering from Skipton Building Society. Um, and I'm also going to talk you through some of the, uh, the potential dangers, pitfalls that are going to be coming hand in hand with this, really, because it's never a free lunch. Um, and it's never a perfect solution. By the way, um, please do me a favor. If you do get value from this, make sure that you uh, click uh, the like button. That will be massively helpful. And uh, if you've not already subscribed, then feel free to subscribe. So let me just start this off by providing a little bit of context. I did a talk for Barrett's about uh, three weeks ago. So Barrett, the developers, and um, <clears throat> they asked me to speak to the audience about, you know, saving for a deposit, so on and so forth. And as part of that uh, talk, I actually showed them this slide. Now, this is uh, a survey on the average length of time it takes for uh, people to save for a deposit. So it takes eight years, according to Barclays Mortgages, for someone to pay, uh, save for a deposit on their first home. Now, you don't need me to tell you that there is a, an acute issue with the fact that now we have rising interest rates. Property prices have blown up over the last 10, 20 odd years. They're slightly down right now. We've got inflation at this point in time, but wages obviously haven't been keeping up with any of those factors. And so what's happening is you have a huge disparity between the affordability that people have to buy properties. You know, for in London, for example, you're probably going to get a one bedroom, two, two bedroom flat. If you if you can afford one, that's pretty much a miracle. Right. Especially based on how much you're you're earning. And while some people have gone to the point where you can borrow seven times your annual salary, most of the lenders are still doing the four to five percent. Uh, sorry, four to five times your annual salary in the mortgage affordability uh, calculation. So this news today is going to be very, very welcome around some additional help that is available because I guess the providers are now looking at this thinking there is an opportunity in the market and putting products out there. Now, just to obviously uh, set the scene with this, there are 15. Let me just repeat that. There are 15. So one, five, um, zero deposit mortgages available on the high street right now. Okay, 15 of them. However, a lot of them have particular criteria that you have to meet. So I'm going to share my, let me just get rid of this for a moment, because this is important. They have very, very particular criteria that you have to meet, and not everyone is going to meet those criteria. With this new one, which has been launched today, it's going to essentially mean that more people are going to fall within the net to qualify for this. And another thing that I always hear a lot about is the fact that if you're renting at this point in time, we all know that if you're renting and you apply for a mortgage, that it is very, very likely that your mortgage payment is going to be less than your current rent, particularly if you're living in London. And sometimes it doesn't make sense when you go to a mortgage lender, you look at your rent, you look at the mortgage, and even though the mortgage is less than your rent, they say, no, you can't afford one. It's, it's one of those things that used to really pissed me off when I was when I was advising as a mortgage advisor. But I understand the logic from a banking point of view. This is going to get rid of some of those concerns and that barrier for first time buyers. But like I said, this is not perfect. There are some downfalls with this, I will go through everything. So right, let's uh, jump into the article, I will link this down below as well. After I finish this live, so that you can go and uh, reference this uh, yourself and read through the article. But um, this is the headline that we've seen today, which is now being reported. So Skipton Building Society launches a 100% mortgage to help renters onto the property ladder without a deposit. Now, the reason for that, like I said, is because when you look at it on paper, well, actually, your, your rent is oftentimes 
more than your mortgage payment. So this is trying to find some way of actually being able to bridge the gap. Now, what do we know? Let's talk about the interest rate first. So they are going to be launching this on a five-year fixed rate deal. Oh, go back up. On a five-year fixed rate deal. And the rate is going to be 5.49%. Now, bear in mind that within how these mortgage lenders come up with their, their interest rate, loan to value is always a big consideration. So your loan to value is what's the price of the house and how much are you borrowing against the price of the house? If you had a 10% deposit, your loan to value would be 90%. If you had a 25% deposit, your loan to value would be 75%. And the lower your loan to value, the better the rate you're going to be able to get. So bear in mind, this is a 100% loan to value mortgage because there is no requirement for a deposit here. They are upping the interest rate to compensate the risk that they carry. And there is a very, very big risk with this, which I'll come on to a bit later on. So it's 5.49%. This is fixed for five years. And the maximum term you can have with this is 35 years. So 35 years is the maximum term you can have. Now on that little paragraph right there, like that little sentence right there, there are some other questions which I'm gonna ask shortly. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to provide some context for you as well. But what this is basically saying is they will lend you up to 4.49, so 4.5% of your salary. So in other words, if you're looking at a property worth, I don't know, 200,000 pounds, for example, right? You're going to be, you're going to need to probably earn around about 27, 28,000 pounds to be able to get that amount on a 100% uh, mortgage with a 100% loan to value, right? So it's really important to understand if you are going to use this, you're shopping around, Make sure that you're taking into consideration these multiples. Now, the maximum amount you can borrow is six hundred thousand pounds. So this will help people who are in inner cities like London, where you know you're probably paying what three hundred thousand pounds for, if not more, for a one bedroom flat. So really important. Five point four nine percent is the interest rate fixed for five years. Maximum term is thirty five years for the life of the mortgage. They will lend four point four nine percent of your annual salary, and the maximum amount that you can borrow on this loan is six hundred thousand pounds, 600,000 pounds, really important stuff. Now, let me just, uh, let me just check my notes here quickly, because I've made a ton of notes here. Um, right, so speaking about, let me just get rid of this, because this is a really important point. Speaking about this whole equation of mortgage is less than rent, okay, all of the other 15 uh, zero deposit, no deposit mortgages that are currently on the market require you to have a guarantor. This mortgage does not require you to have a guarantor. So whereas before you might have not been able, if you didn't have family that could support you or be a guarantor, they don't have assets or they just didn't want to do it because of the risk, you don't have to worry about seeking a guarantor for this. Now, what you do need though, you need two things. So the first thing you need is you need a pretty decent credit score. So I'm going to do a shameless plug here because I spoke about this extensively in my book right here. The last chapter, the last piece of the formula in my book is all about credit scores. And the amount of times that I've seen people as a mortgage advisor who will apply for a mortgage, they haven't checked their credit score, then all of a sudden, well, they can't, they can't get a mortgage because there was something on their credit score that they didn't quite catch. Your credit score is really important. You have to have a, a healthy, clean credit score to qualify for this. Now, make no mistake of this. You need to think like a bank. What they are doing is they are lending you 100% of the value of the house. You are putting no skin in the game. Therefore, their risk assessments are going to be way up here. They're going to be more stringent with their checks, with their checks, with their checks and balances. And they're going to be looking really deeply at your credit score. Now, your credit score isn't just the number that you see on Experian or ClearScore or um, Equifax. What you should be paying attention to is your actual credit report. And if you don't know the difference, I strongly recommend you go and pick up this book and go and skip to the last part of my basic formula, C, where I talk about credit score specifically. What they're going to be looking for is they're going to be looking for a clean track record of you being able to repay your debts 
And what they're looking for is that you have not missed payments, you don't have late payments, you don't have any uh, county court judgments, you don't have any bankruptcies, any of the like. Now, the good news is that if, if for whatever reason, you do have missed payment, late, late payments, or you might have something on your credit score, if you start early enough, you may be able to put things like a notice of correction or a notice of, of dispute on your credit file to kind of help you navigate this a little bit better. It's not a 100% certainty, but there are certain things that you can do to repair some of the damage that you might uh, see on your credit score if you think it's going to prevent you. And in the chapter in my book, I actually talk about what they look at and why they look at it. So again, it's really, really worthwhile just checking out the book if you haven't already. The next thing you're going to need, and this is going to be good news for anyone who is currently renting, is you need to show that you have not missed any of your rent payments in the last 12 months. So that could be a simple ads bank statement with your rent going out to your landlord or to your housing association, whoever it is that you're renting via, right? A simple st uh, bank statement. I don't know whether they're going to look for a letter maybe from the landlord or, or anything like that, but I think a bank statement should suffice. So no, no guarantor and proof that you've been able to pay rent consecutively, consistently in the last 12 months without missing payments. Now, it is a 100% mortgage, which means that oftentimes, depending on how much you're borrowing in terms of the property price, so let's just say you've got max £600,000, your maximum term is 35 years. One of the things they mentioned in, in this article is that they will try to make sure that your mortgage payment is not more than an average of your last six month rent. Really, really important. So your mortgage payments on this 100% offering, this 0%, zero deposit offering will be, the mortgage payments should be and will be no more than an average of your last six months rent. And this is all about making sure that it is still uh, affordable for you. How this is gonna work in practice, I don't know. I really, really don't know. Because if you're going for a, a property at the top echelon, 600,000, for example, and your rent was something like, I don't know, a thousand pounds a month, I don't see how they're going to be able to keep your mortgage payments at a thousand pounds a month at 600,000 pounds over 35 years. If you're, depending on your age, you qualify for a 35 year mortgage. So there's probably a few questions that you need to ask in that regard. But this really is going to be good news for first time buyers, really, and for renters, particularly in places like London or expensive cities where actually you're just really struggling to keep up with things and being able to save for a deposit. Like I said, it takes eight years on average now for people to save for a deposit. So this is very much a lender seeing that there's a bit of an opportunity in the market and creating something to fill a, fill a gap, to satisfy a need, if you will. Um, and I like the fact that they haven't done it. They haven't required a guarantor. If I'm honest, putting my banking hat on, I'm pretty sure that was a massive point of contention when this product was being designed. Because no guarantor, if you default, yes, they can repossess the home. But what's to say, and this is where I'm going to come on to one of the big cons on this, is what's to say if the market crashes you find yourself in negative equity, what happens? I mean, I know people who in 2007, 2008 found themselves in negative equity. So they they owed more on their mortgage than what the property was actually worth. It doesn't happen a lot, but it can happen. And with a 100% mortgage, there is a distinct risk of that actually happening. God forbid, you know, we're, we're narrowly going to avoid a recession this year, but God forbid in 2024, another crisis comes along, we see a market crash, property market crash, and it doesn't take a lot at 100%. You know, the property value used dip by 5%. You were negative equity immediately. That could be a really big concern. And I don't know how Skipton are going to be able to mitigate that risk. I mean, they're sharing the risk with you. Um, it will only become a problem if you have to sell the property, I guess, um, whilst you're in negative equity, because someone's going to have to cough up the money for that. And it won't be skipped in to a certain degree. It's going to be you as the lender. 
Um, but still, they need to they need to be able to mitigate this on their books. The other thing which um, is a bit of a concern here is back at the top of this where we spoke about the term of the mortgage. So five-year fixed rate, 5.49%, the rate is pretty high. But what happens, what happens if you find yourselves in a situation where after your initial five-year fixed rate has ended, because within mortgages, there is something called amortization, which is essentially where you pay upfront at the beginning of your mortgage, you're paying most of your monthly payments are going towards the interest, which means you're not really paying down much of your capital in the early years. And in the first five years, how much of the interest have you paid versus your capital? It is very, very possible that after the first five year term ends, you could find yourself stuck at Skipton because if you haven't paid down enough of your capital, the debt itself that you own and the property hasn't appreciated in value, your loan to value five years from now could mean that you have nowhere to go in terms of a provider. So aside from this 100% mortgage that you have right now, the other maximum that you can get is 95% where you put a 5% deposit in. So again, if after five years, the fixed rate has ended, you haven't quite paid down 5% or the property hasn't quite appreciated in value to give you a 5% cushion, you could find yourself stuck with, with Skipton. That's still a big question mark. And again, something that I think you should probably be asking the mortgage advisors at Skipton if you're going to be looking at using this. But it is a very, very good option. So I've already mentioned negative equity um, as being a big concern. Uh, I'm just going through my notes here in terms of what I've just written down. I think I've covered pretty much everything, really. Um, it's a really good piece of news. Um, I hope this is going to be received, like, positively. I mean, in my comment section, there will always be somebody who points out or moans that this, this isn't going to help and whatever. Control the controllables is what I say. This is not going to be perfect for everybody. In fact, not everybody should go for this. If in an ideal world I had an option, I would love people to just be able to save as much of a deposit as they could up front and not use this. Purely because this is going to be a very expensive option for you to utilize in the long term. And people will say, you know, I might use it to buy my first home and then I might sell up and upgrade take equity, buy a bigger property, because you're in 100% territory here in terms of no deposit, 100% loan to value, you are heavily reliant on the property market being healthy. And really, you're going to be heavily reliant on making overpayments to ensure that you're eating into as much of your capital as possible. Because I, in an ideal world, you want to build as much equity into that property as you possibly can. And if you start with a 15, 25% deposit, you, you have equity day one. Here, you don't have equity day one. It's going to cost you more. It's higher risk. And you're at the mercy of factors that you cannot control. Um, so I think that that's a really important point to kind of be aware of. Uh, yes, it's going to help people, no doubt, 100%. I have no, no doubt that it will. But you really, really, really need to think about it, like from a practical point of view. And can I just say one thing that I said at the Barrett's talk a couple of weeks ago? I find this a lot with first time buyers. Please don't get caught up with the need or the, um, the aspiration of getting on the property ladder and what that is going to mean and say for you. And the reason why I say that is this. We're in an environment right now where the base, the bank rate has gone up, interest rates have gone up, mortgages have gone up. If you're on a standard variable or on a tracker mortgage, you've felt the pain over the last year, year and a bit. And for first time buyers in an environment like this, you have to be so, so careful. So let me just contextualize this for you. Imagine you go into this, this deal, 5.49%. You're happy, you're fixed for five years. Let's just say a concoction of things tend to happen or could happen, right? Let's just say property market dips. So maybe you're 5% negative equity or so. Let's just say inflation isn't under control. We know that we have another bout of bank rate rises, 
interest rate rises. If you are taking this deal with 100% and your affordability is razor thin in terms of what you can afford monthly to service this is razor thin and you've not been able to earn more money, increase your income or had develop any side hustles in the five year period where you're fixed, you come to the end of that fixed five year period. And like I said, you're underwater in terms of neg negative equity, property markets falling five five percent. You've seen interest rates hike up. If you were at say a thousand pounds a month and that was your maximum, you could barely had any disposable income and you come to be mortgage and guess what? Mortgage rates have gone up 2% and then the fixed rate that you're going to go to goes from 5.49% that you're on to six and a half to seven percent you are really going to struggle. So I have to encourage you, don't just think about that moment of getting on the property ladder. You need to think, right, so in five years time, at the end of this of this initial deal, what, what's likely to happen? How do I prepare myself for any potential increases for, for the worst case scenario, really? You need to think worst case scenario. And people will say that's being negative. That will be, uh, people will say that that's, you know, uh, thinking, uh, again, negatively is probably the right word for it. But sometimes you have to think that way because this circumstance that we're in right now, a lot of people wouldn't have thought that it would happen. But guess what is happening? Many people are rolling off their fixed rates starting now that will see their mortgage payments go up by three, four hundred pounds a month. I mean, God forbid they couldn't afford it when they originally took out the mortgage versus now when it's not just the mortgage payment that is increased, but it's the price of food, energy, all of that is increased. So your disposable income is being squeezed. And again, shameless plug, but in my book, I do talk a lot about how you actually build financial security moving forward. So those are just a few things. I know that there are people in the comments right here. Um, so let me just get to uh, some of your comments and some of your questions as well and see what you guys are saying. Okay, someone's asking here, um, except Barrett, what other de developers um, offer deposit boost? So this is a scheme that all developers should be offering. So whether it's Barrett's, Persimmons, Taylor Wimpy, David Wilson Homes, most of the large developers do have deposit boost. So essentially with deposit boost, I made a video on this a few weeks back. Maybe go watch the full video, but in, in, in short form, Deposit boost is you have a 10% deposit, the developer will give you 5% additional. Now, on that video, people were moaning and saying, well, you know what? Of course, well, it's going to end up costing you money in the long run. It's not free money. Of course, it's not free money. I mean, no shit, Sherlock. Like, it's coming from the developers. So they would have priced into the actual sale price of the property, yeah, to give you a 5% deposit. So, and it's on the sale price as well. So if it's on 200,000 pound house, they are literally going to give you 10 grand. Of course, that's baked in. There is no such thing as free money. So it's worthwhile knowing that. But yeah, deposit boost will be available from all of the developers. It's, again, it's just worthwhile asking them at the point where you're interacting and having conversations with them. There's an investing question here. Cool, right? I'll come back to that in a moment, mate. Let me just see if there's any other mortgage-related questions so it doesn't take me off a tangent. Um, yeah, someone's saying here, there's so many uh, shifting goalposts. I'm not, I have a feeling that the UK recession will come in hot and fast. It's possible. I mean, the forecasts at the moment, at the moment, I think are very, very ambitious, like really, really ambitious. So who knows what's going to happen? I'm looking at things tentatively, <laughs> but um, optimism, I guess, is what the the government and the treasury are trying to uh, to put across. Okay, someone just asking here. Hi, P. Love your content. Can you please put the link for your accountability group? Uh, yes, I can. I have to find it. It's actually on my website. Um, all right, let me do this right now. One second, guys. Let me just put this right now. And I will talk about the accountability group. So the accountability group is something that I have. We have a small cohort of people in here. And what we basically do is we, we have a WhatsApp group and we meet up once a month. And in the WhatsApp group, 
what we do is we set our weekly priorities, our weekly goals, and it's going to be perfect. Not, it, you don't have to be in business, an entrepreneur. I mean, I've got a student in there who's um, at university and he sets goals around university time timetables and university work. I've got someone in property in there. I've got someone else who's a coach, who's a life coach. He's developing his business and his his passion at the moment. I've got a professional in there as well. It's a really, really nice group of people. We WhatsApp in our, our goals every week. We check in on each other. It's quite a nice community now. We have a little conversation in there, a bit of banter. And we meet up every on the first Saturday of every single month. Um, so if you want to join, it's, it's not something that I publicize a lot. I should probably do more in publicizing these kind of things. But I wanted to keep it, you know, relatively small and relatively uh, intimate because I think that having an intimate group of people is always very, very nice, particularly when people are trying to work towards uh, goals together. And we check in, we check in on each other. We we challenge each other. Um, and it's just a nice way where if you are trying to work towards any particular goals, then you're able to do that, um, knowing that you have like minded people that you can bounce things off and ask questions to and you know, just generally have a good conversation with. So I'm just trying to find it for you. Bear me one second. It's somewhere else. Uh, I might have to pull it off my website, actually, to be fair. Um, well, I was thinking of doing it on the other place, on the other side. Uh, where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Where are we? There we go. Our services. Okay, there we go. Ah, oh, it doesn't take you to the right page, though. Mm. Okay, I will take. Uh, look, I'll push you to this uh, page on my website. Um, it's under my services page, and it's called the Peer Circle. So check that out, um, L. Uh, you can join there as well if you want to. It's nine ninety nine a month plus VAT, so it's eleven eleven ninety five or something like that. But like I said, it's a really good group. We talk every week. We message back and forth during the week. We meet up every Saturday. We're actually thinking of organizing a bit of a get together in the summer as well. Edna um, suggested that. So that would be something we're going to be doing as well. But it's a, it's a really nice, cool, close knit group of people. Cheers for that. Right. Let's uh, get back up here and see where was I? Someone's just saying it seems like a guaranteed negative equity in the short term um, seems a bit desperate for uh, de de for devs, especially with the overvalued properties these are available on. Uh, I don't know, man. Look, the market is the market. The market and a market is driven by demand at the end of the day, uh, particularly in places like London. Um, there are too many people wanting to buy the houses. This is the fundamental it's economics 101. It's simply how it works. Um, you wouldn't go and crash or sell something under market value. I mean, I guess they could, but why would they, you know? And, you know, maybe this is the problem with the capitalist, capitalist society, right? For profit, it doesn't always mean that everyone profits. Uh, Leo, you haven't missed too much. I don't think you have. I don't know. I can't remember when you joined. We were just talking about the new um, no deposit mortgage for renters, uh, which is being introduced by Skipton today. No guarantor. You just need to show proof of your um, rental, the fact that you've paid rent over the last 12 months, and you need a pretty decent credit score. And I've just gone through maybe some of the high, high note things that you need to know. And when this is finished, what I will do is I will link the article that I shared uh, in the comments, I'll pin it so that you can actually see see this as well. You can follow up and, uh, and read it yourself. What's uh, Stuart saying here? I'm in 10K debt and I have no chance where the best way to get interest down and clear this. Okay, Stuart, um, what is it on? Okay, what is it on? I, I, I'm not very good at this, but so part of my basic formula so my basic formula is a five is five key areas to pay attention to in order to become your own financial hero and the idea of becoming your own financial hero is being able to make financial decisions out of choice and not out of necessity and all of the everything that i put into the book is from my own personal experience now i have had 15 years where i struggled with debt so i've been in your position right now in the book i actually talk through how you can go about targeting um, and strategizing how to pay down debt specifically. 
So where you've got £10,000, the first thing that I'm going to be asking you if we were doing coaching, and you can pick all of this up in the book because I explain it, is, right, what kind of de debt is it? That's the first thing. Things like credit cards, things like um, payday loans, those kind of things are generally higher interest. If it's a personal loan, then okay, maybe there's a little bit, there's, there's little less work for you to do, but you need to know what kind of debt it is first. That's what I'll be asking you. I'll be asking you to have a look at what your um, interest rates are. So how much are you paying? What are the interest rates on the cards or the personal loan, whatever that might be? Um, we'll then be having a look at your, your finances. And in the book, the first part of the formula is about budgeting. And I talk about putting your finances into three distinct silos. And for you, you'll be using the third silo more than anything else. You'll need to focus on the, the first two. So your essentials and non-essentials, seeing what you can cut so you could put money into the third silo, which would be a way for you to then pay down your debt as much as possible. We'd have to go over that. But there is, a, there is an example that I give in the book. So I do a case study in the book and the case study covers uh, credit cards, personal loans, so on and so forth. So I know it is a bit of an outlay. I think it's 13, 14 or something like that on, on Amazon right now. But I would strongly suggest pick it up the book if you haven't already, because the uh, avoid debt, which is the second part of the formula, is where I've got the case study. And I talk you through the way I kind of approached it uh, and just generally bits about debt that are important. But the practicality of that will be really, really helpful for you. If you're really, really struggling, you just want someone to speak to, mate, then what I would suggest that you do is maybe go and speak or pick up the phone to um, Step Change. They are very, 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 very good. The concern that I have is when you go and Google some of this stuff about getting out of debt, what tends to happen is that you will have a lot of services that will be talking about how you write off your debt. And look, there is definitely a place for it and it will definitely suit some people. But what they're in, what they'll be asking you to do, what they're going to lean you down the, the road of will be individual voluntary arrangements or bankruptcy or a debt relief order or a debt management pay, uh, debt, debt management plan. All of those things will have a massive negative impact on your credit score, particularly if you go down the route of things like bankruptcies and stuff. Like it can take you years to recover from it and take it from me. I spent 15 years trying to recover my stuff, recover my, my credit score and get out of debt. I put a lot of that, my experience into that chapter in the book. So you'll get a lot of insight from there. But if you want to speak to somebody who can help you, then definitely go and speak to someone like Step Change because they are amazing and they're able to give you a little bit of guidance and they just won't go straight to the whole uh, debt relief plan or bankruptcy or IVA. They will actually sit down and, and maybe go through a bit more of a pragmatic plan for you as well. So hopefully, mate, that helps. Right. Where was I? Um, just trying to find where I was. Bend me one second. Someone's just saying here, why is an expiring leasehold um, a bad thing? Right. So an expiring leasehold is not good because... If you have uh, a leasehold property, it means that basically you don't technically own the land that it's, well, own the land that it's on. So you have to pay a lease for the land that it's on. So if you have like a property with a leasehold where it's ending, I would say any time in the next 50 years, some people, some mortgage providers will say 100 years, all of a sudden it's problematic because nobody really knows for sure whether you'll be able to renew it. And because you have such a short period of time on the leasehold, what it does, it plummets the, the value of the property. So whilst it might be attractive to go and buy a place that is undervalued because it has a short lease term or expiring, I mean, God forbid, an expiring leasehold, if it's got an expiring leasehold, then it's all about whether you're going to be able to renew it and how much it costs you to renew it. So really, typically, you should be looking at one that has a leasehold in place and has a relatively long time before the leasehold actually ends. You can buy properties where it's a freehold, which means that you don't have to worry about the leasehold agreements or the leasehold terms. But generally, it's not a good thing because it will have an impact on the property value and the cost of actually um, extending the leasehold or getting a new lease sometimes can be quite expensive too. So it's not necessarily a good thing. Cool vibe. 
All right. It will be great to see you in there, mate. It will be absolutely amazing to see you in there. Um, and yeah, we can set goals together and move towards things. Um, but like I said, it's a really, really nice small, uh, small group at the moment. Ah, I mean, it's nice to meet you at the Birmingham uh, Pension B event uh, two weeks ago. Holly Remick had been buying Pete's book. Do it ASAP. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. Really do appreciate it. And it was good to meet you as well. Safe to assume that 100% mortgage did not apply to be... No, it does not uh, apply to buy-to-let properties. Unfortunately not. And the reason for that is this, right? As a buy-to-let property, you're an investor. So you're going to be using it for commercial gain. So the government is not going to incentivize you to acquire a property, which you're going to rent out. And it's not necessarily going to solve the home ownership problem as it's deemed that we currently have. So it doesn't apply to buy to let properties. Unfortunately, you're still going to be limited to that 20, 25% deposit that is required um, for buy to lets, unfortunately. Evening. So Michael is also a part of uh, the, the group as well. So good to see you, Michael. We haven't caught, you've been away. So Michael's been married. He's been on, he's been on honeymoon. We haven't actually caught up properly. Um, it will be good for us to catch up, mate, because I'd love to know what you've got planned for your podcast as well. In general, I'm seeing a uh, little encouragement to have an emergency fund in place and work on debt freedom beforehand uh, will be used for repairs and contingencies of very responsible advice. It depends on the circumstances, it depends on the property that you're going into. If you're going into a, into a, an, into a new build, you have uh, the builder's guarantee for 10 years. So what contingencies or repairs will you have to carry out? Because most of it will be covered um, if you're going into a new build property. If you're going into an existing old build property, then obviously you should have one. But, you know, you can talk about you know, in the scheme of things in the real world, right? If people's priority is to get on the property ladder, yes, they should have an emergency fund. But most people use their emergency fund because they see the property as the priority unfortunately. And in three years of coaching and 15 years in financial financial services as of, you know, in different roles and especially what, seven, seven odd years since I qualified as a financial advisor and mortgage advisor, you can tell people to have an emergency fund, but the practicalities, life is very, very different. Practicality, yeah, you should have one in theory. In life, people don't often use the emergency fund, keep the emergency fund, then save more money for a deposit. I mean, the average time people are spending saving for a deposit is eight years. So get an emergency fund that is probably going to be a good proportion of your deposit anyway, and then extend another eight years on top. And all the while, your, your house, house prices are going up, so you're going to need even more deposit. In the real world, that often doesn't happen. And yes, it is good advice to have an emergency fund. Yeah, it's great advice, but practica pr practically, it doesn't work. Should you be debt-free? You're not going to get a mortgage if you have a ton of debt. It just doesn't work for the affordability. So that comes out in the wash as well. But a, a lot of personal finance is, is, is personal what, all of the time. That's one thing that I've definitely learned. What works for one person doesn't, doesn't work for the other. And whilst we would always want to have, you know, I would love to be in a position when I was in my 25, 25 to have a deposit, an emergency fund, investments, pensions, and be on the property ladder. But the reality is most people, most of us are not earning enough money to tick all of those boxes all in one go. And so what we have to do in practicality is prioritize the things that matter next and walk towards those. Once we achieve that, we can move on to the next thing. It's all about doing things in an individual step-by-step -step basis as opposed to trying to do the collective all in one go. But that's just my, that's just my take given my experience and just people that I've worked with and, and the things that I see. Uh, all the time it's just it's so so hard it really really is and if you could fix the world you would give everyone you know a decent wage but then what does that do for that does a nightmare for inflation because everyone's earning more money of course the price of things are going to go up even more it's mad really and it, it really just kind of it goes to to ask the question whether the the current shape of of western economies the western world and capitalism works anymore. Many people will argue that it just doesn't, it doesn't work. The maths is not mathing, as they say. It just isn't. Um, let's have a look at this one. 
Would you recommend putting spare money into in, into investing S and P five hundred or other funds than buying fifteen twenty year later outright rather than going down the mortgage route? Uh, so this is the equation of property versus investing. Look, it depends on your circumstances. It depends on what you see the future to be for you. Okay, so you so there are there there is huge risk on one side. Like if you invest in the S&P 500, you've got the investment risk. And people will say that the S&P 500 has grown, which it has historically, 100% it has. But what happens if at the point where you need to access money, the markets dip? The same could be said on the property side. So you have to weigh up the pros and cons of both. One of the things that I think, because I do a lot of coaching and a lot of life planning with people in coaching, I always talk about, okay, so when you fast forward to the fact that at some point you're not going to want to work anymore, do you still want to be paying rent? For most people, the answer is no, because it would be nice not to have that psychological burden of I've got to pay rent, then I've got to pay energy, food, all this kind of stuff. Now, if that isn't true for you and you don't mind paying rent, then the question then becomes, will you have enough investments, pensions, uh, saved up cash assets to supplement the rent and the income that you need or the things that you need to pay for and the killer equation here is inflation you know our target is two percent right at the moment but inflation is at 10.1 percent if in 40 years time inflation is 15 20 percent you've invested hopefully your investments have kept up kept up but if they had a really rough ride they may not have and so you've got to weigh off that balance. You've got to weigh off, you've got to weigh out that, that risk and balance that risk as, as best as you possibly can. And for most people, when you sit them down and really go through the detail of it, like, okay, look, really visualize what it's like. What do you want it to be like? Most people will say that they'd rather not have to pay rent when they come to retire, which means a mortgage, paying down the mortgage before you actually get to retirement. And you can do that still investing in the market, still paying into a pension. And in the pension under current legislation, you can still take 25% of that to help you pay down any lump sum that you might have at that point. That's just my experience of working with people. And what I see as the consensus when we do life planning in that way, most people are like, I'd rather not be in a position where rent is still a factor for me because rent is, still, is inflationary. So your rent may be 600 pounds now. I mean, there was a story probably about a month ago, a lady in her, in her late 50s who was renting. And because obviously interest rates have gone up, rents have gone up, you know, she finds herself not being able to afford where she lives. And she's now sofa surfing with friends. I mean, who wants to be at that stage of life in that position? So you really have to ask yourself, you know, what, you want that to be like later on in life. And sometimes it can be very, very difficult to, to visualize that far into the future, but you have to try to do it so that you can make the best decisions now. And that's one of the things that I, I want to try and encourage on this channel. Social media is such that it's all about the quick win, short attention spans, short time frames. We need to have an element of our psyche thinking about the long term. And again, that's one of the things that I stress in my book particularly when we get to the, the I of the formula, of the basic formula, when I talk about invest early. We need to think, yes, in the present, but we have, need to have at least one part of our eye on the future and trying to make the best decisions now that will serve us in the future. And whilst it might seem that, that that's far, far off, it will be there just like that. It's like wrinkles. One minute they're there, they weren't there, the next they are. You don't know how they got there. So it's really, really important, but really good question and a long-winded answer, I know. But I think context is always very, very important when you're discussing these, these things because it is quite nuanced when you really get down to, to the nitty-gritty of it all. <laughs> Cheers, Michael. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it, dude. Um, it helps keep you motivated and achieve your goals you set at the beginning of the year. And that's the whole point. You know, I, by the way, this isn't just like in the peer circle. Let me take these off actually, because these aren't actually working in the peer circle, by the way. Um, 
it's not just other people setting goals. I like I set my weekly goals and what my weekly priorities are. Some weeks I meet, I meet them, some weeks I don't. Um, one of the things that I'm I've been particularly poor at meeting are my gym goals, my fitness goals. I'm just so busy finding the time to do that is is a nightmare. Another thing that I've been horrible at doing is I've been saying for you know, Mike will, will attest to this. I've probably been saying now for the last six to eight weeks that I need to book a holiday. I've not been able to do that. I'm too busy. Um, and they do keep reminding me. Um, so it's something that I know I need to do. Um, and I am currently looking at um, getting away for maybe three weeks, but it, it can't be until July, unfortunately, because I'm booked all the way up until then. Um, but yeah, it's not just everyone else who's in the group setting goals. I'm also setting my goals as well, because it is about achieving my agenda, my objectives for this year and having a group of people uh, to do it with is is always great because you can hold each other accountable and you can move towards your goals together. And at the end of the year, what we will do is we will get together and see, right, what did we achieve? What did we hit the, the key metrics, the key objectives that we set out at the beginning? Um, and if not, why? And dissect that and see what learnings and what lessons we can learn from them. But I think doing things together in a group is always better than doing it on your own. You know, uh, I think there's a there's a saying, if you want to go far, go alone. If uh, I can't remember the, exactly. It's something along the lines, if you want to go far, go alone. But if you want to go further, go go with a group of people, something like that. And I, I truly believe that. And accountability helped me do wonders in 2021. I, I lost my accountability part, uh, partner at that time. So having this group is really, really nice. And Michael is a valid, valued member of that of that group. Yeah, what does rampant inflation mean for a house for a house deposit for purchase, say in the next year or so? I can't invest invest it because it needs to be short term and then be it'll be rolling away. Okay. Um, what does rampant rampant inflation mean for a house deposit? I mean, look, if we have runaway inflation. Inflation is all about the cost of things, the idea that you won't be able to purchase what you can, what you can today in two, a, a year's time, two years time, three years time. Now, how this might manifest in your deposit is particularly if there's house price inflation. So house prices continue to go up, right? If you're not able to grow your money to keep up with that rate, then you're going to have a negative impact because you're going to need more deposits. So you've got to do more work to acquire that deposit, right? That's what rampant inflation would look like for a house deposit specifically. But, you know, I've got to commend you as well, mate. Like the fact that you're not thinking about investing it, bravo, like seriously. I mean, I speak to so many people like, I want to buy a house in two, three years time and I'm, I'm going to invest it in the market. I'm just like, dude, it's too much risk. Like, can you imagine, can you imagine you it's all going great guns the money's in the market yeah great you're, you're you're excited then when you need your deposit like literally just as you need your deposit market crashes you think it doesn't happen but it does happen it happened to a friend of mine who actually worked in canary wharf luckily it didn't completely scupper his plans he was able to find money elsewhere but i think james he lost i think it was like three thousand pounds or something like that because he thought hey, i'm gonna put it in the market might get an extra 500 quid or a thousand pounds. He didn't, he lost money. And the fact that you're thinking like that is really, really good, mate. So well done. Uh, where was I? <clears throat> you need to talk about salary sacrifice. Um, yeah, I mean, look, salary sacrifice is great. Um, particularly if you're at the higher rate of, of, the tax bands where you're starting to lose your personal personal savings allowance. It's it's also good if you're on the lower end as well, because essentially what that means is that any, especially if you're selling sacrificing into a pension, you're, you're sacrificing that before tax goes up. So the contributions are a little bit larger. Um, so yeah, salary sacrifice is a really, really powerful thing, particularly if you're at that echelon where you're earning over 120, well, 120,000 pounds, because over a hundred thousand, you start to lose your 12,570 pound, uh, personal allowance. So effectively, anything over that amount, you go from a 45% tax threshold, potentially up to 60%. It's pretty mad. So people will use salary sacrifice to kind of get them back within thresholds and stuff. 
it's painful. It's so, so painful when you get to that point. And like a lot of people obviously aspire to it, which is great. And, and it is something definitely to aspire to. But I remember the first time that I had the realization that hang on a second, I've lost, not only have I lost my, my personal savings allowance, but then realizing that actually my effective tax rate was around about 60%. Literally, I wanted to cry. And you look at the pay slip and it's just so, so painful. And I know that that's quite a luxury luxurious place to be but it, it definitely it definitely wakes you up it really really does i'm just looking through um just looking through the comments here thank you very much andy appreciate you thank you very much for picking up the audio book i like this yeah I'm helping on, on, on racking up a fat deposit to avoid negative equity. I'm bearish on the housing market for the next few years. Yeah, really good call, mate. I like that a lot. Right, there was one question on investing up here. So let me just go back to that because I did say I was going to go back to it. Uh, it was right at the top. Okay, yeah, this is from you, Call Vibe. Um, so you were asking here, I'm getting into investing. What's your views on rent to own? Uh, stay renting and invest and hope with compound interest over time. Uh, okay, cool. I think we kind of addressed that in that last one, right? Talking about S&P 500, um, renting, that kind of stuff. Um, at this stage, and this is what I encourage a lot of people to do, you know, think about life plan, life plan. And you don't have to go 15 years into the future. If you can, that's great. But even if you do it for the next three, four, five years, that's it's a positive thing uh, to be able to do. Um, and it can be hard sometimes because you have to visualize and get and sit down and really think about it. And you don't have to be beholden to what you, to what you note down. That's really important to know. You don't have to be beholden to that um, either, but it just at least gets your juices flowing of around what you kind of would want. Um, so you can make the decisions that you need to right now to make that happen. Um, this has been a much longer live than I expected it to be. Um, I thought I was going to do one for maybe 15 minutes and that was it. But um, it's great to have you on here. I know that I've been really, really quiet. I've been being pulled left, right and center at the moment. And um, I took a break yesterday. So there was no podcast episode um, out on any of the platforms or either on the channel uh, yesterday at 12 o'clock. Uh, I just needed to take kind of like a day out, um, basically. And I felt a little bit guilty because it's breaking my routine. But um, I feel so much better today getting up and coming to work, knowing that I didn't stress myself out or work full pelt yesterday. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to try and do that a little bit more. But yeah, I know that I've not, my, 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 my uploads have been very, very irregular. That's just because of demands of day to day. I've been doing a lot of traveling, doing a lot of talks. Um, the book has kind of been a bit of a whirlwind as well. Um, so I'm just trying to find my routine again. Um, and get back into the groove of things. I kind of look back over the channel over the past, you know, videos for the past maybe three to six months. Um, and I don't know. I don't know whether all of the videos were useful or not for people who watch the channel and follow the channel. Um, yeah, it's on one hand, looking at my analytics and looking at what what's going well on the channel. And if I'm honest, not a lot looks like it's going right on the channel right now. And so... I start to think, do I need to change things? Do I need to go back to the drawing board? But at the same time, this channel is not the same as it used to be when I, when I first started in 2020. Things have changed a lot. I mean, I've got a lot busier. I'm doing different things now. Um, Kevin, thank you for the super chat, mate. Um, I'm doing different things now. And so, yeah, it's, it's really, really hard to, to strike the balance between all of it. And I'm trying to take the next step. I'm trying to figure out what is next and um yeah youtube is in there the podcast is in there but for where i want to go next i know that youtube alone isn't going to get me there so i'm trying to make sense of it all um i really really am and that's that's hard to do sometimes uh particularly when you see other channels that are growing way more than i am but then i have to think about the context of I'm doing very different things now. It was always a dream of mine to have a book out. I've got a book out. It was always a dream of mine to, as a byproduct of YouTube, have a regular spot on TV. I've got a regular spot on TV. So it's leveraging that to amplify the message even more, to help people even more. 
And I'm trying to figure out how I put that into a structure where people can come into it and actually get tangible benefit when they need help in a post to sit in there trawling through hours upon hours upon hours of videos on YouTube, hoping that they get the right answer. So that's kind of where my head's at right now. And so I'll continue to make videos, no doubt. In fact, I was researching a video um, earlier today, which I am going to do, which is about four weeks late. I'm going to be talking about the impact of fees on your investment portfolio. And what I've done is I've sampled an investment amount, a term, a return, and I've taken three providers just to do a comparison. And actually doing the numbers early this afternoon, the, the difference is staggering. So that's going to be a really interesting video. So that will come if not this week, next week. But um, I appreciate you guys for always being here and supporting. Um, I, I try to I try to make videos as useful and as helpful as I possibly can. I just don't know whether they hit all the time. Um, so hopefully you found value in this one. And again, thank you very, very much, um, Kevin, for that super super chat. I'm sending you this. This is feel about <laughs> Mads Valley School. Uh, yeah, look. I don't know how we got dragged to the point where actually, hang on a second, what, Liverpool, is Liverpool only one point behind us or two points behind us now? It's just, oh my God. I don't know what's going on, mate. I think they're just tired. And this is the depth of squad and what happens when you lose two important players and in, the, in um, what's his face? Varane and um, Martinez. Who knew, eh? Who knew? But, hey, hopefully we'll finish the season strong. I am going to be watching City and Real Madrid this evening because Benzema, please, 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 please come and just do what you did to Liverpool. Please, I beg of you. Because the idea of City winning a freaking treble is unthinkable right now. Um, and they're going to beat us in the FA Cup final. I'm not arrogant enough to, to assume that they're not going to. They will. So, hopefully, <laughs> Arsenal can keep the run going and win the Premier League, and hopefully Real Madrid can do the business tonight and completely shut them out. But if I'm honest, I cannot see. I mean, Haaland is just a beast. And the way they're playing right now, oh my God, I don't know. But it's Real Madrid. They know how to win. They've got experience. I just think Haaland is going to be, is going to be too much. And I just feel as though he's got a big night in him. And he might not do it. He might not do it away, but he'll definitely do it at home. And if he does it away, it's over. It's over. They'll, I can. I just cannot see them going to the to go into to to the city ground and, and winning. I just can't. I just can't see it. So, fingers crossed. Um, GT Ploy boy. Oh, brilliant! Thank you, mate. Let me just find this. Thank you very much. Uh, listen, if you do so, I, I I do check the reviews for the book on Amazon, by the way. Um, but if you have read it, like GG, you've said here that you've finished reading it, it's brilliant. If you can leave a review on Amazon, that would be amazing because it's always nice to read what people take from the book, what people have, have learned. I mean, I can't tell you, I cannot tell you how petrified I was of that book going out. I mean, seriously, the, it wasn't real. There were two moments where it became real. The first one was, um, when I got the physical book and I did a video, I posted that on uh, Instagram. I think I've done it on here. That was on, that was very, very surreal. But shortly after, and I think it was the day after I got that physical book, my editor said to me, so now we're going to send it out to, um, to some financial journalists um, and we're going to ask them for comment on the book. And I tell you not, my stomach, oh my God. I was petrified because all of a sudden I was like, hang on a second. So it's going to go out to people at the sun. It's going to go out to people at the financial times. Oh my God, what did they read the book? And they absolutely ripped me to shreds. And I started double checking. Did I, did I, did I make any mistakes with any of the content? Like proper imposter syndrome, right? And people are like, oh, you, you know, this is all, you, you're all, like, trust me. Yeah, I was really, 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 I was a nervous wreck. But then the payoff to that is, I think it was about a week or so later, it got picked up by The Sun as one of the books to read to turn the page on your money woes. That was amazing. Uh, and then we've had positive reviews literally all the way through it. So it's it's been really nice to pick up and just go on Amazon and read what people have said they liked from the book. Um, it's made it all the, worth, all the worthwhile and validates a little of the thinking too. So thank you very much, GT, for that. And thank you for the super chat too. Appreciate you. All right. <clears throat> That's right, Veron. We are. <laughs> we are playing that the treble is stopped at all costs. 
And uh, you, you know what? I was taking the piss out of um, Arsenal after, you know, the three matches where they lost their 2-0 leads. They got outplayed and trumped by, by City. I was laughing. But as we have got closer and closer and closer, I've just been like, mm, actually, you know what? I really, really, really don't want City to win. So I am in full support of, uh, of Arsenal at this point in time. And I'm, I hope, I hope City either lose a game, Arsenal continue to win the last few games that we've got. And I hope Real Madrid do the business tonight. Please, please. But we'll see. Anyway, <clears throat> debt and taxes just said, uh, let me just see this quickly. And I want to say thank you. Thank you very much. You're just saying just bought the book after much delay. Looking forward to arriving. Thanks for the advice in advance, Mar Marlon. Thank you very much, mate. Really do appreciate it. All right, guys, thank you so much. Just over an hour for this live, which should have been 12, 15 minutes. Um, hope you found value. Um, if you haven't already, please smash the like button. And if you do know anyone else who is a first-time buyer or someone like that who might find this useful, it would be great if you could also share this with them as well. That would be amazing. But thank you so much for watching and giving me an hour of your time on a on a Tuesday evening. Catch you later.